another love voice different communist collabo look at that um i um wanted to like just um before i like start like the the presentation um uh say uh in advance uh that like um i want to keep it um as uh short as possible uh but um help put enough elements in my presentation um to be the basis uh for a really good discussion um and i hope and and highly encourage uh people um to like uh participate in discussion i know oftentimes especially when it comes to the questions of oppression like racism uh, a lot of people have a lot of different anxieties about speaking on the issue uh, for fear of showing how little you know about the question, for fear of saying the wrong thing, uh, for fear of like, you know, what comes out. Uh, um, and I think that uh, is especially important um, in meetings like this, uh, that we actually use it as a space um, to bring all of the questions that we have, like all of the concerns that we have, all of the confusions that we uh, uh, might have um, uh, to the floor um, so that like we can actually like make progress and tackle like this very complex question um, in a, uh, a collaborative and comradely and collective way. Um, so with that, I wanted to just open up uh by like saying that um is interesting um for this event um to uh come off of the heels of uh the tragic death and the brutal death of uh Tyree Nichols or not off the heels but you know um uh after uh, uh what was a, a very high profile death uh, that followed a number of other high profile deaths, like the activist uh, uh, Tortuguita uh, in uh, Atlanta, um, and the death of, uh, I think his name is uh, Keenan Anderson, who was the uh, teacher who was killed um, uh, in California. Um, and I think that with the death of Tyree Nichols and, and the other folks that I mentioned, um, and the kind of public like outcry like showed um uh is in a sense um the specter of uh 2020 um and how strong uh that movement was um how uh, dynamic uh, and transformative it was um and how it uh created uh, a set of like uh conditions um and uh political dynamics uh that like was able to like challenge uh, and delegitimize um, like you know sectors of the state, uh, namely like the the police. Uh, but um, because uh, there is an absence of a national organization uh, that represents the movement itself, uh, politically independent of the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, the Democrats were able to um, respond. Uh, by giving out like a few um, important um, but insignificant concessions uh, by firing uh, the police officers uh, who killed Tyree Nichols. Um, and uh, it meant that Joe Biden was able to invite uh, the family of Tyree Nichols to the State of the Union address where he got to deliver uh, a, loop, uh, a very uh, milquetoast speech about police brutality and the need for the uh, George Floyd uh, police reform bill to pass, um, which is not, by the way, uh, the main demand or slogan that came out of the movement. Uh, those uh, demands and slogans being defund and abolish, right? Uh, and so the absence of like a political alternative meant that the Democrats were able to step in um, and co-op uh, and and uh, you know push down like that anger and dissent. Um, and what that means is that you know for revolutionaries, um, the question that the struggle uh, for police brutality um, and the struggle for Black liberation um, uh, brought up um, in, that was brought up in 2020 uh, is is still alive. Um, uh, though highly demobilized, um, and that is crucial uh, that we develop a revolutionary perspective to engage, you know, like in this conversation, uh, in those dynamics that are still playing out. Um, like for the Marxist movement, 
we have long identified the importance of taking up issues of oppression, uh, which are linked but different from the issues of class exploitation. And yet the history of our movement and indeed the history of class struggle shows the difficulty of tackling and engaging um, in this most challenging uh, and changing dynamic question. Um, while there are many subjective failures on the part of the Marxist movement um, uh, to tackle the question of oppression in a serious way uh, or to understand um, the dialectical and interdependent link between oppression and class exploitation, there are a number of objective factors that make it challenging. Um, uh, factors that require us to uh, study uh, and engage in the history and social phenomenons uh, that make up uh, the conditions of oppression. Um, and to illustrate that point, I just wanted to read a little quote from Engels, uh, who, you know, in a letter to a supporter, um, you know, stressed uh, that, um, one second, let me grab it real quick, sorry. Um, that uh, it is absolutely uh, important that all history, this is the quote, quote, all history must uh, be studied afresh, the conditions of existence of the different uh, foundations of society must be examined individually before the attempt is made to deduce from them the political, civil law, aesthetic, philosophic, religious, et cetera, views corresponding to them. Um, and that's just a way of saying that, like, it is not enough just to use the jargon of materialism or dialectics uh, to attach to questions um, and to call them, like, done. Um, uh, I think that, like, too much of the positions that the left adopts is not based on systematic study of political dynamics, but moral proclamations with Marxist terminology and generalized knowledge. And I understand the disdain that many people have, uh, you know, uh, especially folks who've been part of the academic left uh, or having to deal with, uh, you know, abstract intellectuals who are allergic to the class struggle, uh, but that can't be a reason to adopt an anti-theoretical approach. Um, it is not enough just to use the word theory, but for us, we have to do the theoretical work um, which is one of the reasons why I think having a revolutionary publication is a big part of how we do revolutionary work. Um, and just to say, like what I tried to do in the editorial that I wrote uh, for Black History Month is to like deal with like the existing dynamics um, as they are, like as factually uh, as possible, um, because I think that um, is, again, really important um, that like we not rely on, uh, 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 again, moral proclamations uh, to deal with uh, injustices and, and um, inequality. And I get it as an activist, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good um, and right uh, to not feel like you need to be an expert on racism in order to denounce it and take a position. Uh, but there's a limit to that being a practice. Um, I guess what happens, folks, if we don't develop a more systematic approach to history um, and the conditions that we face today, uh, that allows space for the liberals to feel, right? So like politically, like the ruling class uses racism as not just a tool to divide workers, but um, to further policies that deepen exploitation and prevent working class consciousness and solidarity from taking place, right? Um, they get to define the debate um, and, and make it a false dichotomy uh, between class reductionism on the one hand or identity politics on the other. Um, and the only way that like we can combat that effectively, right, uh, is through like a systematic approach where we're putting forward like concrete analysis like of like how these dynamics actually play out. Um, and one of the ways in which I think is important for us to do that is by showing concretely who the working class is, right? Um, and one of the things that like I made clear in the article that I wrote is that the working class is black, like black is hell. 
Um, but so too is a large percentage of the people who are unemployed and incarcerated. And so like what's so interesting is that like the capitalists are able to do two things. One, like use the material means obtained through imperialist plunder to give the American working class a general like um, uh, a, a better standard of living than what most folks uh, around the world experience, right? Um, and couple that with like racist stereotypes, um, uh, they get to determine and shape like who the working class is, right? Like when you hear the word working class and oftentimes when people are talking about the working class, they rarely refer to who the working class is and the diversity that is part of, right? Um, and the only way for us to like fight like against that like propaganda um, is to show life actually uh, to people like who the working class is. And I think that's important for two reasons. One, because it helps us increase working class consciousness by like showing concretely like who people are and what their relationship to labor is and what it means for them to be exploited. Um, and also who's part of that process, right? And, and how like the working class is like multi-ethnic uh, and, uh, and multi-gendered, right? Um, but I also think that it's our way of concretely showing people where like their power lies um, as people whose activity whose economic activity is foundational to the development um, and the maintenance of capitalism. And I think that's incredibly important when we're talking about questions of oppression, uh, because we have to make it clear that actually people's power does not come from being oppressed or the level or intensity upon which you experience oppression is not the equation for what your social power is. Um, like your that if Black Lives Matter wants to achieve like the goals of defunding and abolishing the police, that it has to understand the police in the context of a system that is ran off of exploitation of labor. Um, and that uses oppression to like maintain that system. Um, and so it paints like a real concrete picture of why it is necessary to have the working class. And this isn't to dismiss the social power of mass mobilizations or social movements, but it is in reality, not only to point out some of the limitations of those movements, uh, but also like, how like people who are participating in those movements can use their relationship, their like strategic place in labor, when they, especially since so many of the people who participate in these struggles are working class, um, like you know, uh, to like uh, achieve like the goals of the movement, but also um, to think about what it means to wrestle with demands that challenge in reality like the whole foundation of an economic and political system, right? And what it requires to change that. Um, and I think that's uh, a, an important thing to like, you know, uh, spell out, uh, especially uh, in the concrete specifics of like, you know, 2023 and where people find themselves, like how people can make sense of like their experiences um, uh, I think that that's something that like, you know, we have to like fight hard to like put forward um, in a real way. Um, and I think that uh, one of the ways the left needs to think about like how to um, deal with those dynamics um, is like putting forward demands um, and discourse uh, that, you know, uh, like points to the need like for the working class and oppressed to have its own political organizations, um, its own like organizations of like combat and struggle. Um, and I think we have to like, you know, not just like call out the Democrats and Republicans as institutions that can't like um, represent like the working class and oppressed, uh, but why the working class and oppressed like need to develop political organizations like a, a, a party for the working class uh, that that deals with like the issues of like exploitation and oppression. Um, and I wanted to like 
in it there, even though I got a bunch of other things to say, uh, in the hopes that like, you know, that gives us like some groundwork to think about like, you know, how we want to like engage in this conversation. Uh, so sorry. For that. Thanks, Tristan. Um, my turn. Uh, uh, re really appreciate that. And yeah, um, great, great to work on this with you, uh, this meeting, um, comrade. Uh, so yeah, uh, in, the, in the spring of 2020, after George Floyd was murdered and the nation witnessed the heroic response of the Minneapolis rebels, Denver rioted for five nights. And by rioted, I mean assembled in giant rowdy marches that responded to violent police repression with defiance. And then early on the morning of the sixth day, Denver's chief of police linked arms with black activists to lead a Black Lives Matter march. This was just a handful of hours after police finished tear gassing the previous night's march. And police did this elsewhere, uh, Austin being one notable example. Um, the, the activists who invited the police into the anti-police march had come into the movement out of nowhere. One worked in the mayor's office, another was a former cop. As you might expect from their name, We Are Love Denver, the organization threw a wet towel on the movement's smoldering anger. Uh, the counterinsurgency effort worked. It was matched by the authentic, organic sentiment of Black and other liberals who were already discouraging militancy. Uh, it confused the movement. Aren't we supposed to listen to Black leadership? Protest numbers immediately dwindled. Uh, but state violence, counterinsurgency, and the dominant politics of reformism weren't enough to put out the fires. Uh, Denver imposed a curfew. The FBI hired an informant to rack up charges against anyone they could ensnare in their traps. A Colorado Springs police officer in infiltrated mutual aid groups. Uh, after organizing a protest that surrounded a police station, Five activists were stalked for months and arrested in dramatic fashion, all simultaneously uh, on, on trumped up charges of kidnapping the police. Uh, new laws were passed, new, new laws against protests were passed around the country, though I don't think there were any locally. Um, uh, Right-wing attacks on marches were given not even a slap on the wrist, but a pat on the back. Uh, Left-wing self-defense was met with extreme charges, uh, including uh, murder and attempted murder uh, in, in, in two local cases. Um, so locally, what is the state of the struggle for Black liberation? It's not good. <laughs> um, uh, lo local organizations and individuals prominent in the George Floyd rebellion fell to two major trends, uh, one deactivation and two reformism. Um, so, so first of all, we saw lots of deactivation and de dissolution. Almost none of the organizations that, that cropped up around this time survived. Um, just through chaos and cannibalism, snitches and snitch jacketing, um, this, this pseudo COINTELPRO and counterinsurgency stuff and grifters, so many damn grifters. Um, anarchists lowered their sights from trying to change the world to trying to purge bad actors from protests and they redoubled their focus on charity. Uh, the PSL who were important leaders during George Floyd seemed to have abandoned the issue of racist police violence. Um, so that kind of covers deactivation and dissolution. And then uh, on reformism, I, I got to say it remains our biggest competitor and, you know, will until the moment of revolution. Um, uh, and it's the, the three main institutional expressions of reformism, I would say, are electoral politics, uh, the, the NGO complex, and the labor bureaucracy. And all three um, had their role to play in um, the neutralization, I guess, of, of, uh, of 
of, of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, regarding electoralism and NGOs are kind of tied up together, but you know, activists sought office, um, are seeking office, um, activists from, from this movement and you know, canvassing for Democrats, um, self-identified abolitionists formed nonprofits to reform the police by working with them. Um, as, the, as the first Black Lives Matter movement waned, uh, a prominent Black-led BLM organization created forums for people to, know, to get to know the candidates for, for the district attorney at the time. And, and they en ended up enabling the eventual winner of that race to position herself as a racial justice DA, as if that's not a contradiction in terms. Uh, and years later, of course, she has proved to be quite the opposite. Um, uh, th this time around, uh, they organized similar forums for mayoral candidates. Um, and one of those mayoral candidates is a former uh, high profile protest leader lo locally um, who, you know, we ha had a relationship with for, for some time. Uh, but more recently, like we had an argument about def uh, just the slogan defund the police, which was considered too radical uh, for his campaign. Um, uh, let's see. The, the DSA basically stayed out of the fight locally. There was, they had no organized presence in the streets here. Um, we hear that they accepted the liberal identity politics view that said that they had no standing because they're a predominantly white organization. Uh, we also know that fighting oppression is considered a distraction from bread and butter class-wide issues uh, it, it, in this uh, class reductionist uh, brand of, of socialism that, 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 that they practice. Um, and then uh, regarding the labor bureaucracy, uh, can't, can't let that get, get away without getting a couple jabs to the gut. Um, perhaps because they recognize the importance of organized labor and political activism, activists from the DSA, CPUSA, and the PSL locally have insinuated themselves into various union bureaucracies by taking paid organizing jobs. But this is another top-down shortcut, shortcut to political influence that just doesn't work. Um, so meanwhile, cops keep killing. Uh, anger continues to bubble underneath the surface. Um, that, that specter of 2020, as Tristan called it, is, is right there. Um, uh, the, but the state manages it via a mix of repression and concessions. Um, the conviction of Derek Chauvin in early 2022 and the charges against some of Tyree Nichols murderers, uh, the white one still hasn't caught a charge as far as I know. Um, uh, th those, those convictions and charges had a demobilizing effect on the movement. And I think that's why they happened in, in, in a sense. Um, but, but fake concessions can be just as good as real ones. Um, remember how increases to annual increases to annual police budgets were billed as defunding because they were smaller than the originally planned increases. <laughs> um, in Colorado, Democrats and NGOs teamed up to end qualified immunity. Uh, that's what grants cops immunity from civil lawsuits. Um, and so all the headlines read Colorado ends qualified immunity and local activists were repeating it. But the new law actually only ends 5% of qualified immunity or up to five. Uh, uh, it, it's $25,000 or 5%, whichever is less. Um, so, but, but, you know, that, that passes for, for, you know, meaningful reform. Um, so all in all, the George Floyd rebellion brought massive leaps in consciousness. 54% thought the burning of the Minneapolis police station was justified, but minimal advances in the organizational expressions of those leaps in consciousness. When millions rose up for black lives, millions of minds opened up, however briefly, to new paradigms. Why is this country so damn racist? Why are none of the proposed solutions working? As revolutionaries, we wanna see those questions run deeper and deeper until they grasp the root. 
We attempted to meet that moment before the window closed again because consciousness retreats along with resistance. Uh, but we were woefully unprepared to have a mass effect. How can we do better next time? I think that's one of the, one of the underlying questions for tonight. Um, as fellow Marxists, we fundamentally share Left Voice's analysis of oppression and, and exploitation. Uh, I would say Marxism seeks not to separate exploitation uh, from issues of oppression, but to show how they are connected and to show how the solution to one cannot be separated from the other. Um, racism arose to justify chattel slavery, the worst imaginable historical instance of both ex exploitation and oppression. And it has continued to, in order to justify continuing inequality, as well as to serve another purpose useful to capitalism, to divide and conquer the multiracial working class and to blunt class consciousness. Racist ideas don't spring from the hearts of born racist and will die racist white people. They come from and prop up the economic organization of our society. Their acceptance or rejection is contingent on any number of factors, including the fight back of the oppressed and the efforts of anti-racists. Uh, the Denver communists are dead set on being one of those factors. Uh, we never decided it per se, but after eight years in the movement and working with uh, justice families, the, the, uh, those who have lost a family member to police murder, we have committed ourselves to a permanent orientation on anti-racist and anti-police activism. Why? Uh, well, I would say, first of all, out of solidarity, um, out of a recognition of an interconnectedness that is hidden by the ruling ideas. As Marxists, we recognize that all members of the working class have an objective material interest in fighting all forms of oppression, including those who don't experience them. Uh, we also recognize the explosiveness of, of racist police terror. Uh, perhaps more than any other issue, it has the power to tear this godforsaken country apart and to tear open minds. Uh, and then, you know, I would say we consider it our, our Lenin given duty to be tribunes of the people, uh, not mere trade union secretaries. Uh, we're devoted to bringing revolutionary socialist politics to the struggle for black liberation and to the struggle against racial oppression more broadly. Nothing less will do. All other avenues lead the struggle back to where it started or worse. We, we take Lenin very seriously when he said we have to be able to quote, react to every manifestation of tyranny and oppression, to generalize all these manifestations and produce a single picture of police violence and capitalist exploitation and to take advantage of every event, however small, in order to set forth before all our socialist convictions and our democratic demands. So likewise, we are also devoted to making the struggle for black liberation central to the fight for, for socialism. Again, nothing less will do. It's not really a choice, but a recognition of an interdependence that exists in reality. These, these things are tied. <laughs> Uh, whether we recognize it or not, uh, black liberation and socialism, that is. Um, the class reductionists are not only chauvinists and cowards, but they're wrong. A rising tide does not lift all boats and prioritizing anti-racism does not alienate those who don't experience racism or it doesn't have to. Millions of non-black Black Lives Matter protesters demonstrated this. To paraphrase uh, Bolshevik revolutionary Inessa Armand, if black liberation is unthinkable without communism, then communism is unthinkable without black liberation. And she said that about women's liberation, but. Uh, so I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be having this conversation with Left Voice and to be continuing to deepen our relationship. Uh, and by the way, we're immensely grateful and for and dependent on your work, if you hadn't noticed. So, so keep it up, y'all. <laughs>